Okay, let me start this video out with those of y'all that know that uh, or y'all heard me speaking on the spreadsheet that I have with all the members' names that I've been able to research. And I'm going to show you an example of what it is that I'm talking about with this one case here that was from September the 1st of 1994. His name was Robert Sandifer. He's an 11-year-old little boy. They called him Yummy. And shout out to what used to be Windy City Chicago is now Windy City Report. He's the only one that I have heard mention about Yummy's set that he was a part of being the eight ball set. I read it in some police court documents, but I had never heard anybody else speak on it. So shout out to him. And I will include a link to hit this video that he did that was a very good detailed video. And he has a lot of other videos. I was watching him and Zach and just say cheese TV before I ever even had a channel on YouTube. So that gives you an idea. But on the spreadsheet, like I said, I put the set that he belongs to. Then I also put the perpetrators and the set that the perps are uh, involved with, photograph, and the case ID or connected cases. Now, in Yummy's case, I could not find a case number directly for his murder, but this is the case number for Craig Hardaway, Hardaway's excuse me, uh, incident. Now, where it says connected cases, I'll give you an example. Like here, where it says Carl Spencer, he was part of the 600, uh, the alleged perpetrators was Little B and Tutu from Jarl City as the date. Now this is the actual case number, but in this case number, reading the documents, I was able to connect all these other cases to it, whether it be by the guns involved or whatever it is, witnesses, different things like that. Here's another one up here. So, as I get down the list, that'll give you an idea of what it is that I'm referring to. Now, to give you an idea of how many of these I have, like I said, this one up here is Yummy's. I believe it was 1,979. And as I was going through this, you'll see some yellow lines going straight across. Um, there's some other cases that I remembered that I did not have on this list, so I've got to still go back and add them because I have there is this bottom. I have so many different spreadsheets going that I started throughout the years, and I have to make sure that everybody is added to this one. So let me give those of y'all that's not familiar will with Robert Sandfield. Uh, a little background. Since this is the kind of environment Yummy's grown up in, Robert Yummy Sandifer was born on March the 12th, 1983, the fourth of 10 children born to Lorena Sandifer. His father, Robert Atkins, went to prison three months before he was born. And Lorena was a prostitute who neglected her children, according to the news reports. On January the 19th of 1986, they removed Robert Jr. from his mother's home when the police found him and his older siblings in the house alone. DCFS, the Department of Children and Family Services, intervened in August of 1986 and turned Robert and his siblings over to his grandmother, Janie Fields. But a Cook County probation officer, according to Time Magazine, said that Fields' home was not a nurturing place for Robert. The young Robert found refuge in, street, in the streets amongst gang members, as most young black males do 
who grew up poor with no family, no friends, no education, and little opportunity. Yummy joined the gang and racked up a record too long for his young age. You can see here, it says January 92, he was arrested. Uh, pros- uh, July 92, prosecuted for a robbery. Case was dropped because the witness didn't show. January of 93, attempted robbery, trying to steal a jacket. Witnesses didn't show. Case dropped. May of 93, attempted robbery. Key witnesses didn't appear. June of 93, robbery charge. Sentenced to two years probation. He was only 10. Now, in general, this is kind of the story that we hear on the surface. But there's also, like I said, details that I've never heard out across social media, the internet. So I'm just going to read together. It says, the four foot six, 86 pound, 11 year old Robert Yummy Sandifer brought unwanted international attention to the BD gang in late August, early September of 1994. Yummy belonged to the BD set called the Eight Balls because this particular set of BDs was geographically located at 108th Street, which is down in the Roseland area. Yummy was not a sweet pea, nor simply an associate. He was a BD member. Yummy got his name Yummy because he liked cookies and sweets so much. By the time Yummy reached the ripe old age of 11, when he would be executed by his own gang, he had already accumulated a record that included 12 felony arrests. His set of the gang sent Yummy to shoot at some GDs. His gang chief gave Yummy a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. You guys know the recoil on a gun like that. If you've never shot one, all you got to do is watch something on TV. You will see even a man's arm is going to jump. Says the result was predictably tragic. Yummy did fire the weapon and he was able to wound two members of the GDs. However, a stray round from the gun fired by Yummy ended up killing a non-gang member, a 14-year-old girl named Siobhan Dean, who was simply an innocent bystander. Chicago was outraged and horrified at the event. Yummy hid and went back to the eight balls. Then members of, from adjoining Black Disciples sets from Edbrook executed Yummy, shooting him in the back of the head with a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. As small as those are, I can tell you from my own experience, they're loud and they have a, a little kick to it. The geographical grid of Chicago is used to give us each set of the BDs its distinct name. Yummy belonged to the 8-ball set of the BDs. This set is based at 108th Street and Perry in Chicago. The set whose members actually killed Yummy is located on 107th and Edbrook, called the Edbrook set. Another nearby set includes Dirty Perry. The Black Disciples set at 107th and Perry, which... Remember, this is back in 94. Now, those lines move around constantly. Two youths, both BDs, were arrested for killing Yummy. Derek Hardaway, who was 14, and his brother Craig Hardaway, 16. Both told police that their gang leader directed them to get rid of Yummy. Their gang leader had provided them with the car to transport Yummy in. The ruse being that they would take Yummy away from Chicago. Now, I was able to find some information on his father, Robert Atkins. He passed away at the age of 58, back in July the 15th of 2015. 
He was born in Chicago. And I didn't copy the whole thing because I didn't feel it was necessary. His mother, Love Robert, Robert's mother, was born in 65. She passed away February the 15th of 2005. So, at this point in time, they are both deceased. Now, to the best of my knowledge, Yummy never even met his father. There's nowhere on record that I can find any information about his mother or grandmother taking him to see any of his her in-laws or other side of the family, whichever way you want to refer to it as. However, I will tell you this. Throughout the research on Yummy and the, all the other children that were affected, whether they were shot or killed themselves or uh, arrested for the, the shootings, I was able to find all the parents, mothers and fathers, on all of them, with the exception of one. And I point that out because that's part of the story that I don't hear people speak on. But we're going to get to that. Or should I say, I'm going to let somebody who is directly involved speak on that. And there's a connection and why there's a connection. And they will explain. And this connection has stayed hidden so well even people in Chicago have come accustomed to telling the story in the wrong manner. Maybe they're just making assumptions. I don't know. But we're going to get to the truth. Now, for us to get back to Yummy and the 8-Ball Gang and what went on with him, we're going to have to jump over real quick and get a little history. Because of the eight ball set being part of being under the black disciple umbrella, we have to understand where that came from. And not to go into a long history, because a lot of us already kind of know the history, but in 1958, when David Barksdale and the other gentlemen created the black disciples, In time, things evolved with people and the, and the gangs. And by the mid-70s, King David had passed away. And prior to that, he had joined alliances with Mr. Larry Hoover and the Gangster Disciples to make the Black Gangster Disciple Nation. Now, like I said, King David had passed away. Mr. Larry Hoover was getting locked up or was locked up. And he decided to put Dirk Atlin in charge. They call him Don Dirk. The reason why he's important is because I'm going to give you some audio from an interview that he did discussing the Yummy situation. The story that I'm familiar with that um, Yummy was um, put up to um, shooting at some of the gangsters. Um, Yummy um, made a mistake and hit a certain leader, niece, killed her. The certain leader supposed to um, told the guy that um, either um, they took care of that or they were going to come and they were going to start killing all of them. And um, it was a hit ordered on them, which shouldn't have never happened. You know, they should have went to war, you see, because what I didn't like, y'all put him up to go shoot at somebody. He do it and make a mistake, and then he lose his life doing what y'all asked them to do. They should have fought that war. That's what they should have did. You see, because 
If you put him up to do it, you should have stood by his side. That's what should have happened. Now, I played that first because I wanted you to hear it from the mouth of one of the leaders. Now we're going to go back and look at the legal documents and see what story has been presented to the American people and to the gang members. So try to keep those few details in mind as we unravel the tale that has been told for all these years. Now, before I forget and get too far down the road on this video, I will be dropping a link in the description box as well for Vlad TV's interview with Don Dirk. It's an hour and 16 minutes long and it covers many topics. And I think it's very interesting if you are interested in this type of content. It's very important to understand the history and understand the truth. I just watched uh, another well-known channel right now who put out a video about Yummy about the same time that this interview was being done, maybe a couple of months before that. And this channel claims to, you know, have connections in Chicago. And I've seen them go to Chicago and make videos. And, you know, some of their content's really great. And some of it kind of falls short. You know, and I'm not, that's why I'm not saying their name because I don't want to really call them out like that. But the thing is, is that in the video that I just watched, it was like, they said that Yummy shot two people, but they lived. And one was a boy, one was a girl. And the girl was actually the other male going by the description of the injuries that they were speaking on. So, and he kept talking about how he did his research. He did, he read all the documents from the police and this and that. I get it. We got to say things to catch y'all's interest, to get y'all's attention, whatnot. But over here, we're really going to go into those police reports because I'm going to share them with you and you're going to see them and you're going to see what's said. Now, you've already heard what Don Dirk said. Please don't forget those major points. That's why I only took just a small clip because I want those points to stay in your brain when we do go through the police reports and statements. Now let me show you right here on the map at this 219 West 107th place. The home is no longer in existence, but that is was the home last known to Yummy, Robert Sanderberg. And if you'll notice, these are some names that will you will be learning along the way. Siobhan Dean's home is right here. Technically one block over. Now, at 1030 in the morning on August the 28th of 1994, 11 year old Yummy gets up, leaves his grandmother's home, and starts walking almost three quarters of a mile. See, some of the youngsters in the neighborhood had learned and picked up this hustle they would run. And it was up at the gas station, is where the hustle would take place. What this hustle was, was they had acquired stolen credit cards from people one way or another, whether stealing their purses, stealing wallets, whatever the case may be. And their little hustle was to go to these little smaller mom and pop type gas stations and they would offer to fill up their tank of gas, their tank with gas, excuse me, for like $10. And that's how they would make 
their money when they weren't selling drugs. Now remember, you're an 11 year old, it's 10.30 on a Sunday morning. And this is where you're gonna try to earn some money. Now many of us on a Sunday morning, if we didn't have our family in church, maybe we would have them down at the park to play, things of this, this nature. But sadly, this was not the case for Yummy and his family. They live in different circumstances. Now, as I stated earlier, I was unable to collect any court documents concerning Yummy, but I was able to get copies of Derek Hardaway's appeal hearing. And in this hearing, there are statements from all that are involved. So let's take a look at these and get it from the actual people involved, what they had to say. All right. Is the 14-year-old defendant and his brother Craig, Derek is... 14 year old. Craig is a 16 year old. They are brothers. We're charged with the first degree murder of 11 year old Robert Yummy Sandiford. Because of his age, the defendant's case was initiated in juvenile court. Following a transfer hearing, the defendant's case was transferred to the criminal divisions where he would be tried as an adult. Prior to separate trials, the trial court conducted a joint hearing on the, follow on the defendant's motions to quash arrests and suppress statements. The pertinent evidence at the hearing established the following. On August 28, 1994, Sandiford, a member of the Black Disciples Street Gang, shot 14-year-old Siobhan Dean. And this is Siobhan. She was graduated at her graduation from eighth grade. Sixteen year old Kiata Britton which the only thing that I can find online is this article which states he was sixteen and was shot twice in the back at 108th Street and Perry Avenue. He is one of the ones that tells the police that the shooter was 11-year-old Yummy and 17-year-old Sammy Say, C-A, or I guess it's Say. And this is Sammy back in 94. Now, Dean died as a result of her wounds and an intensive Police search for Sandiford ensued. Police hunted Yummy, putting descriptions of him in the paper and pounding the streets for the 11 year old on the run. By midnight, August 29, 1994, the Chicago police were working with FBI agents with 20 to 30 officers involved, dozens of police officers, tactical units, gang crime officers, detectives joined by the FBI Fugitive Task Force fanned out searching for the boy as far away as Milwaukee, which is nearly two hours away where Yummy had a relative. This was all put out in the Chicago Times at the time. At around 12.22 a.m. on September the 1st, 1994, Sandiford was found under a viaduct in the area of 108th and Dolphin. So again, an intensive police search for Sandiford ensued around 12.22 a.m. on September the 1st, 1994. Sandiford was found 
under a viaduct in the area of 108th and Dolphin. Sandiford had been shot twice in the back of the head. Three empty shell casings were found near his body. In the early morning hours of that same day, Mrs. Cassandra Cooper phoned the police and told them that Sandiford had been at her home at 10609 South Edbrook at approximately 11.30 p.m. the night before. The Cooper home is nine blocks from the viaduct where Sandiford's body was found. Miss Cooper told the police that her daughter, Jessimia, saw Sandiford leave the Cooper's porch with Derek Hardaway and that his brother Craig was involved. Shortly after 7 a.m., police took Miss Cooper and Jamissa to Area 2. Now, as I read to you the different statements that people made, I will say this, I'm probably going to not repeat a lot of the detectives' names because I'll butcher them, and I'm just going to say the detectives. But I also really, really want you to understand how everybody's statement is just a little bit different. This is not unusual. This happens even in today's time. But I believe in this situation, the cops somewhat just made up their mind. And because they had the whole nation's attention on them, they just wanted to go ahead and slap charges on someone. And you'll understand by the time I finish reading off these statements. There was a lieutenant and two detectives that had been assigned to investigate the murder. After learning that the witness reported having seen the victim in the company of the defendant and co-defendant less than one hour before his death, the three went to the Hardaway's home. At approximately 8 a.m., the detectives arrived and spoke to the, the defendant's father at the door. After identifying themselves, they asked whether Derek and Craig were at home explaining that the police were investigating the murder of Sandiford and they had information that his sons were with Sandiford shortly before the murder. Mr. Hardaway stated that Craig was not at home, but Derek was. He brought Derek to, to the police in the living room. They told the defendant that he had what they... They had told his father and asked the defendant to accompany them to the police station to help with the investigation. The defendant agreed to go with the officers. Mr. Hardaway also told the defendant to go with the police and see what was going on. The officers informed the parents that the defendant would be taken to the area to police headquarters at 727 East 111th Street and offered Mr. Hardaway arrived if he wanted to accompany his son. Mr. Hardaway declined, now remember this later when we read his statement, saying that he would wait at home for Craig. The Hardaways lived about 12 blocks away from the area too. Detectives gave Mr. Hardaway his bus their business cards with their phone numbers. The Derek left the room unescorted to get dressed and was patted down but not handcuffed while being transported. Upon his arrival, he was placed in an unlocked interview room. The detectives interviewed the defendant shortly after arriving at the station. The defendant admitted to knowing the victim, but stated that he had last seen him three days previous. The detectives then left the interview room and spoke with Jamisha Cooper, who was in another interview room. Jamisha told the detectives that she had been sitting on her porch at 10609 South Edbrook at around 11.30 p.m. the previous evening with Mike Griffin and Sandiford when the defendant came from out of the gangway and approached the group. Jamisha had known the defendant for several years as he had slept over at the Cooper's residence on occasion. The defendant told Sandiford that he had to go with Derek that Craig and the boys wanted to take him out of town. Jamisha then saw Sandiford walk through the gangway towards the alley with Derek and Mike. The police knew that the defendants 
and his brother were members of the Black Disciples Street Gang and lived one block from the Coopers. Sandiford's body was found at 12.22 a.m. A canvas of the neighborhood turned up information that shots had been fired in the area of the viaduct at approximately 12.15 a.m., some 45 minutes after Sandiford left with the defendant. After speaking with Jamisha, the detectives re-entered the defendant's interview room. They again asked the defendant when he had last seen Sandiford. The defendant repeated that he had not seen him for three days. The detectives then read him his rights, his Miranda rights, and advised him that he could be tried as an adult. The detectives confronted Derek with Jamisha's statement. The defendant then changed his story. He told the detectives that at 11.30 at night, the previous night, he was in the car with his brother Craig when they saw Sandiford on the porch with Jamisha Cooper and Mike Griffin. Craig told the defendant to go get Sandiford. The defendant said he walked to the porch and told Sandiford he had to come with him because they were going to get him out of town. The defendant said that Sandiford and Griffin followed him off the porch and went to the car. Craig then drove off with Sandiford. The defendant walked home as did Griffin. The de detective testified that it was at this point that the defendant was no longer free to leave the area. Later that same day, and don't forget, this is a 14-year-old in an integration room by himself. No attorney, no parents, anything. So later that same day, Mike Griffin was interviewed and told the police that the, the defendant had gotten into Craig's car with Sandiford and the defendant refused to give Griffin a ride home because they were too deep, in too deep. A detective testified at 4 p.m. that he relieved the other detectives in the case and he contacted an Area 2 youth requesting that a youth officer be assigned to participate in the interview with Derek. The detective was told that they were in the middle of shift change and a youth officer would assist shortly. About 30 minutes later at 4.30 p.m., the detective entered Derek's interview room accompanied by a gang's crime specialist. The detective read Derek his Miranda rights and advised him that if he was charged, he could be transferred from juvenile court and tried and sentenced as a, an adult. Derek repeated the statement at 10.30 a.m. that he had made at 10.30 a.m. The detective testified that he then told Derek that Mike Griffin had said something different. Derek said he did not believe him. So the detective then told Derek to walk down the hall and showed him where Griffith was in another interview room. It's called intimidation. Derek then told the detectives that he did indeed get into the car with Craig and Sandifer and that he was present when Craig shot Sandifer under the viaduct shortly thereafter. During the late mornings of September the 1st, other police officers had gone to the Hardaway home looking for Craig, but he was not home. Mr. Hardaway promised to call the officers as soon as he heard from Craig and told the officers that Craig had a girlfriend named Chantia. The gang's crime specialist testified that around 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon that him and the other officers had located Chantia's house. Shantia told the officers that Derek and Craig Hardaway had come to her house around 7 p.m. the previous evening, that Craig later received a page, and either Craig or Shantia called the number which appeared on the pager. Shantia and her cousin then drove Derek and Craig to Emma's house in the area of 108th and Perry. This was approximately at 10.30 p.m. Shantia did not see them again that night. The officers took Shantia to the area of 108th and Prairie, where she identified Emma's house as the one located at 118 West 108th Place. Shantia accompanied the three officers to the Hardaway home where Mr. and Mrs. Hardaway were. Mrs. Hardaway paged Craig, who, got, who called and agreed to return home. When Craig arrived, an officer explained to him that his brother was at the police station and that he witnessed and that witnesses had reported seeing Derek 
and Craig with the victim approximately 45 minutes before he was killed. Craig asked to speak to the officers outside his parents' presence, so the three officers accompanied him into the kitchen. One of the officers advised Craig of his Miranda rights and asked him of his whereabouts the previous evening. Craig told the officers that he had... He had been with Shantia the entire night, at which point off, one of the officers told Craig he was a liar and placed him in handcuffs. This happened at approximately 5.30 p.m. Gang specialist crime officer also testified that after the shootings by Sandifer on August the 28th, the police thought that the leaders of the Black Disciples Street Gang had probably ordered the murder of Sandifer to silence him. Now, Assistant State's Attorney testified that she interviewed Derek at approximately 7 p.m. on September the 1st. So now Derek has been there since the early morning hours, and it's now 7 p.m., unaccompanied by his parents, an attorney, or anything. And he's 14 years old. She introduced herself to Derek and also introduced Derek to the youth officer. Detective also was also present with this interview. They read the defendant his Miranda rights again and informed him that if he was charged in connection with the murder of Sandyford, he could be tried and sentenced as an adult. The detectives asked, or the, excuse me, the assistant state's attorney asked Derek to explain to her what the Miranda rights meant, and Derek did so. Derek told the assistant state's attorney the same version of the events that he gave to the detectives earlier at 10.45 p.m. I'm sorry, excuse me, that he had given the detectives earlier. Then at 10.45 p.m., the defendant gave a court-reported statement to the state's attorney in the presence of the other detectives. Then the youth officer testified at 6 p.m. on September the first, he was present when the detectives interviewed Craig Hardaway. At 7 p.m., the detectives met with Derek Hardaway with assistant state's attorney and another detective in the presence. They were all in presence. The assistant state's attorney told the defendant that he would, they were observers to assist Derek if he had any questions or any problems that they could help him. If there was anything that she could do to help him at that point, to which he told her no. She testifies that he also gave a statement at 10.45 p.m. A juvenile probation officer testified as to Derek's prior contacts with the criminal justice system. Prior to being arrested for the murder of Sandy Bird, the defendant had 12 court referrals for delinquency, three other court referrals adjusted in complaint screening, and seven station adjustments, which basically that was 12 times he was skipping school. That's it. Mr. Hardifat Hardaway, the father, testified for the defense that he had requested to accompany Derek to the area to, but the police refused. He also testified that he and his wife placed two phone calls to area to, one at approximately noon and one at 8 p.m. on September the 1st, and the police officers who answered the phone refused to allow the Hardaways to speak to Derek. Telephone records do indicate that two phone calls had been placed from the Hardaways' home to the area two, consistent with his testimony. The trial court denied the defendant's motion to quash the arrest and suppress evidence, finding that the police had probable cause for the arrest. The trial also denied the defendant's motion to suppress statements, finding that under the totality of the circumstances, the statements were given voluntarily. The state's theory at the trial was that the victim, an 11-year-old member of the Black Disciples Street Gang had been killed by members of his own gang because he was wanted in connection with several shootings and was bringing intense police pressure on the gang. 
the state presented the following evidence. But let's remember what was said by one of the leaders, Don Durr, as to why the, or the order was actually made. It was, according to him, made by one of the GD leaders because that was his niece that was shot and killed. But according to the authorities back in 94, it says, through the testimony of two police officers and Sammy Say, the state established that on August the 28th, 1994, Kianta Britton was shot twice in the back up at the corner of 108th and Perry. Britton told the police that the victim had shot him. A short time later, 16-year-old Sammy Shea and 14-year-old Siobhan Dean were shot in the area of 108th and Wentworth, around the corner from the first shooting. Shea was shot in the leg and the hand, and Dean died from a gunshot wound to the head. Shea testified that there were more than one shooters, and that he did not see the person who shot him, but that others told him that it was yummy. The police then began looking for the victim, which was yummy. After learning that the victim was a member of the Black Disciples, the police looked for him in places where members of the gang were known to live or congregate. One of these places was 118th West 108th Place. The police went to these places on numerous occasions and ran numerous background checks on known gang members in those locations over several days. Cassandra Cooper testified that she saw Sandiford on the street in front of her house at 10609 South Edinburgh at 11 p.m. on August the 31st, 1994. She knew that the police was looking for him. Ms. Cooper spoke to Sandiford, and Ms. Cooper testified that she had convinced Sandiford to go to his grandmother and then turn himself in to the police. Ms. Cooper then telephoned Sandiford's grandmother, Janie Fields, and asked her to come pick up Sandiford at the Cooper home. When Ms. Cooper returned from making this phone call, she saw that Sandiford was no longer on her porch. Ms. Cooper saw Sandiford's grandmother drive up in the van, but she could not find Sandiford. Ms. Cooper testified that she could not sleep that night because of the fear of what would happen to Sandiford. When she heard that Sandiford had been found murdered, Ms. Cooper called the police and told them what she knew and that her daughter, Demisha, had seen who Sandiford left with. An officer testified at, that at 12.22 a.m. on September the 1st of 1994, a pedestrian flagged him down and reported having the victim's body, found the victim's body in the viaduct at 108th between Dolphin and Cottage Grove Avenues. The victim's death resulted from two gunshot wounds to the head. A 25 caliber bullet recovered from the victim's body was consistent with the three caliber shell casings found at the scene. Now, Michael Griffin testified that on August the 31st, 1994, he was at a 14 year old member of the Black Disciple. He was a 14 year old member of the Black Disciple. Shortly after, at 10 30 p.m. that day, he encountered Yummy sitting on the porch of an abandoned house at 105 and Edelbrook. Griffin stopped and talked with Yummy, who said he wanted to go home. Griffin knew a man named Curtis, who lived several houses down on Edbrook, and unsuccessfully attempted to have Curtis call for a taxi for Yummy. Griffin and Yummy then walked to Jamisha's house, which was further down on Edbrook. Yummy gave Jamisha's mother, Cassandra, his grandmother's phone number, and Cassandra went down the block to call her, while Griffin and, the, and Yummy was sitting on the porch. A light-colored Buick drove down Edbrook and 105th. The driver looked like Craig and Derek was in the passenger seat, according to Griffin. Both were members of the Black Disciples. The car stopped near Curtis's house, and Derek got out and walked towards the porch. Derek told the victim that he would take Sandiford out of town. Derek the victim and Griffin then walked through a vacant lot towards Indiana Avenue. When the three reached the alley, Griffin asked Derek for a ride home, and Derek said, We are on something. We will be too deep. Griffin stopped in the alley. 
Derek and Sandiford continued walking towards Indiana Avenue, where they got into the same car Griffin had seen earlier. The driver looked like Craig. Now, Shantia McGlone testified that Craig and Derek Hardaway, both members of the Black Disciples, were at her house around 9 p.m. on August the 31st, 1994, when Craig received several pages. After the first page, Shantia, at Craig's request, called the number on the pager and asked for Kenny. The person that answered the phone said that Kenny did not live there. Craig then gave Shantia a different phone number and told her to call it and tell the person who answers to tell Kenny that Craig is on his way. Around 10.30 p.m. at Craig's request, Shantia and her cousin drove Craig and Derek to a house around 108th Street in Perry. She did not see them again that night. The gang crimes specialist testified that he had investigated street gangs on the south side of Chicago for many years. He testified that Sandiford was a member of the Black Disciples Street Gang and that the, he also testified that Kenny Stump was a leader of the Black Disciples Street Gang and that he and other members of the gang would often congregate at 118 West 108th Place, which is near Perry. Now, the assistant state's attorney also added an additional testimony by saying that Derek had told her that when Shantia and her cousin had given him and Craig a ride to a house at 108th and Perry, that Kenny Stump had told Craig that he had to get rid of Sandiford and that Derek knew this meant that Craig was to kill Sandiford and that Derek said that Craig told him that Sandiford knew too much about the gang and if the police caught Sandiford, he would probably have cooperated and this would lead to the gang's higher-ups getting charged. So Stump had told Derek when he saw Sandiford, he was to tell him to get with him that Derek and Craig were taking him out of town. Stump gave Craig a set of keys to a light-colored Delta 88. Craig and Derek drove to 106 and Edelbrook and got Derek out of the car of the alley. Derek knew Sandifer was in that area because he had seen him earlier that day. He said he saw Mike and Sandifer and that Sandifer was on the porch. And Derek said, I called him and he stood up and I said, come on, come on, I'm fixing to get, go out of town. So he came. Mind you, this is the state's attorney saying Derek said this. So they walked towards Indiana Avenue where Craig was parked. Mike asked for a ride home. Derek told him no. Craig drove Derek and Sandiford to a tunnel at 108th and Dolphin. All three got out of the car. Craig told Derek to walk down to the street where on the other side of the viaduct, Cottage Grove, and look for police. Derek did this and returned to the car. Craig then drove off to look for police while Derek stayed with Sandiford under the viaduct. Craig returned and took Derek aside. He told Derek to get in the car, have it running, don't turn on your lights, have the car in neutral, having the passenger's door open. When you hear a shot, come pull up and get me. But I heard three shots before I pulled up and got up. Derek said that he believed Craig had shot and killed Sandiford and that he drove Craig back to the house on 108th and Perry. Again, that's the assistant state's attorney's statement that she says Derek made. So all in all, the appeals never worked because even though the evidence was showing that there was lack of youth officers' presence when they, Derek made his testimonies, they still said that his testimony was given voluntarily. Now, in another video, we'll get into a little bit more details about what did happen with the Hardaway brothers after they were found guilty 
of first degree murder. 